introduce Mary Kelly, who is the Vice President of Gas Engineering for Con Edison. And before this, you're the Vice President for Construction. Yes. And so Mary is, um, she sits on our board here at the Hall of Science, and we're, also, we're so excited to have her here. So welcome, Mary. Thanks, Priya, for that lovely introduction and uh, warm reception, everybody. Thanks so much for coming out to see us on a Friday night. We, we appreciate you giving up your Friday night to spend time with us. Um, I'm really excited about programs like this on a personal level because I am an engineer and have spent my 25-year career um, at Con Edison in engineering and construction. Um, I have, uh, uh, I lead a technical organization and need people like you to help me deliver energy to the three million customers we have here in, uh, in New York City. And I'm a mother of two kids who are getting ready to enter high school. And I'm also on the board here. So for all of those reasons, you know, this whole topic is really personal to me. Con Edison has had a long-standing relationship, 50 years with the New York Hall of Science. We really believe in giving back to our community and investing in all of you and your science, math, technical education because you are the workers of the future and it, I can say it's a fascinating place to work, the energy field. Uh, we have a really terrific uh, panel of folks here today and uh, you know, I hope you take the opportunity to, to ask them all the questions you have about, uh, about their careers and hear about their journeys and their stories. Um, in, uh, in, uh, in the museum, we talk a lot here about design, make, play, uh, as many of you know. And it really is not just uh, for the museum, but it really translates into the real world. We at Con Ed also believe in really the same principles, design, make, play, but in our world, it's engineer, construct, and operate. But it's exactly the same principles, and it's really we believe the way that people learn best is by doing, which is the play kind of aspect here at the museum. So I think maybe you'll hear some of that um, tonight as well. We really believe that people learn most by doing. We like to have our folks experience different um, parts of the business. I've been in engineering and construction. You bring best practices and uh, things that you've learned from one part of the business to another, and that's uh, really for STEM education. Every project you're on is a little different and you continue to learn uh, for the rest of your life. And that's one of the things that I hope you've been learning about here at, at the museum is how interesting um, and how varied the, uh, the learnings can be. So we're really excited to have you here today and uh, I'm gonna turn it back over to Priya to get the evening started. Thank you. All right, so at this point, I'd love for our panel um, to come join us on stage, and then I'm gonna ask you guys a couple of questions, right? So I know it's meant to go the other way around, but I'd love for us to get to know who's in our audience just a little bit more. Um, and then we'll have, we'll go through, and our panel will introduce themselves, and I'm gonna ask a question to kick off the conversation, and then turn it over to you guys. So if you are reading the bios and, and thinking about questions just in general as they're doing introductions, I'll be walking around with a microphone, or maybe I'll get some help to do that, um, and then just raise your hand if you have questions and we'll, we'll take your questions. So to get started, how many of you are in high school? How many of you are in college? I can see a cluster happening over there. <laughs> I know a lot of those faces too. Um, it's very interesting. How many of you are interested, or and, and you can raise your hand as many times as you want here, in exploring careers in, in engineering, or learning more about that? Careers in energy? Careers in environmental science? So we have folks who want to know it all. Um, we have folks who have kind of an idea of the direction that they want to take, but it just helps our panel to get you know, a visual of like who's in your audience. And how many of you um, are coming from outside of Queens? So thank you very much for making that extra effort. So just to get started, I'd like for us to start with introductions all the way down, um, and then we will just come across. So just tell us a little bit about yourself. Okay. Um, hi, everybody. My name is Marie Trimboli. Um, I'm currently working at Con Edison. 
I'm a senior planning analyst um, and my, in the STEAM department, and uh, my main functions are natural gas planning, um, and then I do a variety of technical um, analyses and um, projects that relate to the generating stations um, and also our distribution system in Manhattan. Um, before I joined Con Edison, I was an HVAC engineer. Um, I designed, I worked for an MEP company, so that's mechanical, electrical, plumbing, fire protection. Um, and I worked on a team that primarily did um, hospitals and laboratory design. Um, I graduated from Cooper Union with a bachelor's in mechanical engineering. Um, and I got my PE a few years ago in HVAC. So uh, that's awesome. A bit Thank about me. you. All right. So good evening. My name is Alex DeSherbinen. I work at CSUN, which is a Center for International Earth Science Information, which is at the Earth Institute of Columbia University. I'm a geographer by training. My son is actually studying to be an engineer at the Webb Institute on Long Island, so he's the engineer of our family, but um, <laughs> I uh, chose the mother of sciences, which is geography. Um, and you can ask me why that's the mother of sciences later if you like. Um, but I did, uh, so we actually were uh, partners with the New York Hall of Science in putting that wonderful Connected Worlds exhibit together. We were the science arm behind that, so I saw some thumbs up of people who enjoyed that exhibit. We, we thought about a lot about how do you represent complex uh, coupled environmental human interactions in an in a, in exhibit space, and then some really cool uh, computer folks got that to work with the connects and everything else so that you can play with it. Um, and uh, my degrees are in geography. I did a, a bachelor's degree at Dartmouth College, a master's degree at Syracuse University up, upstate, and then uh, I recently completed a PhD in the Netherlands. Congratulations. <laughs> Hey guys, my name is Greg Hastings. I'm an engineer at Con Ed also. Um, I work more on the field side of things, so oversee large-scale construction projects for Con Ed. There's a lot of infrastructure that it takes to get the power from where it's generated or where it's coming from into your homes and into stores and stuff around New York City. Uh, so I do a lot of construction projects out in the field on all that infrastructure that we have. Uh, in particular, I work at most of our power plants. Recently, I've worked on some projects where we've upgraded power plants that burned oil converted them over to natural gas. Uh, also did some work on the Queensboro Bridge, which has a lot of our uh, transmission lines. So I've done a lot of uh, interesting construction projects for Con Ed. I've been there for about six years. Before that, I went to the University of Delaware, where I studied uh, civil engineering. And I've uh, been with Con Ed once I graduated from the University of Delaware. So that's a little bit about me. Okay, thank you. Hi everyone, I'm really happy to be here tonight. My name is Wendy Sperduto. I'm an engineer at New York City DEP, um, but I want to rewind and start from the beginning as opposed to um, what I am do now. I actually start, I am from Massachusetts. Um, I am a Red Sox fan, so don't, do, don't throw anything at me. Um, I, I actually started with a, a civil engineering degree from the University of Massachusetts at Amherst. Um, I stayed there for my master's degree in environmental engineering, so I know there's environmental sciences out, out there, and then engineering, I wanted to do both, so environmental engineering was my field. Um, I happened to land in the water field, so I actually um, came to New York City to be um, at the hub of um, one of the largest water supply infrastructures in the world, um, and have had the pleasure for over 15 years to work on New York City's water supply, delivering large water supply infrastructure projects. Um, currently, my role with New York City Department of Environmental Protection, I actually serve as a program manager for a program called Water for the Future. Um, Water for the Future is centered around repairing the largest water supply aqueduct to New York City, uh, the Delaware Aqueduct. It's leaking 35 million gallons of water a day, which for those of you who can't comprehend how much water that is, that feeds the city of Stamford, Connecticut every day. So it's a lot of water, and when the Hudson River is at low tide, it, you can actually see it bubbling at the surface. It is New York City DEP's number one priority to repair the aqueduct, and we are um, in construction right now, um, building shafts and going to start 
construction on a large tunnel this year um, to get in and repair that infrastructure. So I'm actually responsible to manage the entire program because if you can picture shutting down 50% of New York City's water supply, it's significant. Um, so how do we do that? Um, involves lots of complex components, um, other projects that will help to serve New York City's water supply demands during the time when we shut that tunnel out of service. So I'm really responsible to make sure all the components um, go off without a hitch and we actually can connect um, or repair the tunnel in 2021, which is um, a minute in New York City time, so in delivering these projects. So the program's $1.5 billion in infrastructure. It's pretty exciting. I'm really passionate about water. Um, it's kind of the hidden, hidden um, gem of New York City's water supply of infrastructure. You know, you see the Brooklyn Bridge, you see the bridges that these guys work on and other, you know, facilities, but the water is hidden below, below ground and um, it's really exciting. So that's what I do. Awesome, thank you. So I'm hearing lots of excitement and energy and enthusiasm behind the things that you guys do in, in your day to day. And I think just to get us kicked off or a good a, a place to start is, can you tell us a little bit about the part of your job you enjoy the most, but also the part that you find the most challenging? And we can start anywhere you guys would like. I, I could start. <laughs> Work our way down again. Um, so I think um, for me, the most enjoyable part of my job is also the most challenging part of my job. Um, we work in operations, so anything can happen in a minute. Um, and we put out a lot of fires. Um, and I think that um, rush of a deadline uh, really makes you kind of perform at your best. Um, and you work as a team, and that's my favorite part. And it makes you feel um, how important you are because you have to solve this problem as quickly as you can and do it the right way the first time. Um, so I think that's the most enjoyable part. But it's also challenging, obviously, because it, it takes a toll on you, you know, the stress levels. Um, but it also helps you realize your impact, um, especially working at Con Edison, where everything that we do impacts our customers. Um, and that's really important to us. So I think that's my most enjoyable but challenging part. So for me, I would say uh, we, we run a small research center. It's about 40 people. Um, some of you may not be aware, but large universities are not just faculty, but they often have a large number of research staff, people who simply dedicate their time to research. They're not involved in teaching. Um, and that's myself and a number of my colleagues. And uh, we have projects from NASA that cover about 70% of our budget, 60 to 70% of our budget. It's a NASA data center that I help run. Uh, and we have other smaller projects. Uh, I run a number of projects now for US Agency for International Development. Uh, and they're very exciting, but there's, um, I would say, a challenge in balancing competing demands and essentially project management. Um, You've got multiple projects, multiple deadlines. And on top of that, you're also looking at where's the next piece of funding coming because we're a soft money uh, research uh, shop. So that means that none of us has hard salary or tenure, as you would call it in uh, most academic institutions. Faculty, once they pass certain hurdles, they get a permanent job in essence. Uh, that's called tenure. Uh, for us, we have year-to-year -year contracts, and I've never been in fear of my losing my job per se, but you do, uh, there's a keen awareness that you're always looking for that next funding source. And if you do your job well, I think generally speaking, that takes care of itself, but you still have to write those proposals and, and uh, put out the next uh, you know, project proposal or bid. I would say for me, uh, the most exciting part about my job, what I love the most is working on teams with other engineers. A lot of the work that we do at Con Ed is really intricate and there's a lot of stuff that needs to happen behind the scenes in order for our projects to uh, come to fruition. So working on those teams, it's really rewarding working with other engineers, other agencies, outside agencies, um, and seeing that project come from the development stage in engineering all the way through construction where I have it. Now on the flip side of that, I guess the negative part is that doing construction in New York City 
is probably one of the most challenging landscapes of anywhere in the world to do construction projects. Just think about uh, all the infrastructure that's already out there, and we're working around all that infrastructure on a daily basis. So it's not like we're starting with a fresh, brand new site. We have to build these things, construct these things, and uh, do all this work while the city still operates. So uh, while I like it because it's super technical and I get to work on these teams, on these complex projects, it's also extremely difficult with all the agencies and all of the, um, the details that really need to fall into place for these projects to happen. So I think that for me, the most exciting part is um, like Greg said, the engineering, you know, trying to solve complex problems, um, coming up with solutions that, that work within the <coughs> confines of your budget. Um, but all of that excitement around the engineering, um, the challenge that I find is that I always say to my team and the, the engineers and consultants that work with me, we can en we're engineers, we can engineer anything. Absolutely true. So we can find the solution to anything. Um, but we're also in the largest, most complex political <laughs> structure in the country. And politics, unfortunately, rule a lot of what we do. So if it were just to us engineers who just had to crank out solutions and, and, and execute projects, um, my job would be really easy. Um, unfortunately, that's not always the case. So for me, the challenge is trying to understand the politics of decisions that get made that affect um, how I have to proceed with my projects um, and, and the engineering around the projects. Um, as an example, at one point in my program early on, we had to investigate where we were going to get this water to supplement New York City's water system. So we looked everywhere. And when I say we looked everywhere, we thought maybe we could pump the water out of the subway system, the water that just runs into the subway system. We'll pump that and we'll treat it, and that could supplement New York City's water supply. We could also bring barge down an, an iceberg and use that to supplement New York City. And I'm not kidding when I say that was an option that was on the list. Um, but the other thing that was on the list was connecting our water supply to New Jersey, which in terms of a regional solution makes a lot of sense. Unfortunately, the political hurdles around doing something like that were so tremendous that we couldn't actually execute it. Um, so it was really disheartening for me. I was like, oh, this you know, makes sense for the region, but we can't actually execute. So that for me is like a big challenge, but the engineering is just amazing and you know, those, those challenges are really fun. So. That's awesome. So if there were no constraints, right, if you didn't have to worry about budget, you didn't have to worry about like anything getting in your way or politics, I think you guys you know, could take over the world, yeah, absolutely. right? <laughs> absolutely. All right, awesome. So <laughs> we're gonna start with questions from you guys. So if you have a question, raise your hand. Marcia is walking around with a microphone. If I see any hands, I will just point them out. And if you guys don't have any questions, I can keep going, but I'm not as fun to talk to as they are. <laughs> oh, come on. I have one right over here. So just as Marcy is walking that way, if you wanna just introduce yourself, your name, and maybe what school you go to, grade and what school you go to would be awesome. Actually, can you pass the It's gonna be a little chain help, yes. Hi. Hi, my name is Alicia Weaver. I'm in ninth grade and I go to Millennium High School near Wall Street. And a question I have for you is, what qualities or skill sets do you think one would have to need or have in order to be successful in your field of work? Awesome. I'll start this time. <laughs> Take the pressure off. <laughs> so um, I actually think, quite honestly, um, the technical skills and you know the scores on tests are are important. However, I find I interview people all the time for positions, and I could get someone who, in on paper, looks tremendous. Like their GPA was out of control. They did a million things, um, but for me, communication is is very very important and drive. Someone who move, takes a, a problem and, and pushes it as far as they can take it and then pushes it a little further to try to get that solution without you know, reaching out for help. So drive is really important. Communication is super important. If you can't communicate, um, I know a lot of people think engineers can't, you know, like they're in a room crunching numbers all day. That is not true. It's not true in any environment you're going to go into. You have to be able to communicate. So 
you know, try to, you know, do well in school, but, you know, work on your communication skills. It's really important. Yeah, I'd echo what uh, Wendy said. I think that writing skills are really vital. Oh, yeah, um, that may not be your forte mm -hmm. um, if you're in science technology. I don't want to stereotype, but it may not be. So I would really encourage you to work on that and uh, keep plugging away and don't just give up, you know, after doing introductory English in college, but get, keep working on that because you're going to need to write well for just inner office communication, if not full reports. Um, and uh, teamwork's also a really important skill. I think most of you are probably learning a lot of that in college or in high school. And just keep working in teams. If you're not a good team worker, also try to hone those skills and, and uh, learn how it is, you know, what it is to, to put a project together with other, other team members. Yeah, I think uh, kind of what Wendy said, work ethic is really a, an important one. Um, in engineering and technical fields, you're going to go through high school and college, and the classes are going to be really challenging. And you have to have that tenacity to, to really buckle down and, and do your work um, and not get discouraged if you fail a test or if you fall behind on something. Um, and that, those skills will go a long way when you get into your technical career, too. Uh, just an example from, from my career, we're doing a construction project and we're going 100 miles an hour in one direction, and all of a sudden some big roadblock comes in front of us. You can't get discouraged. You have to be able to work through that. So the, the tenacity and the work ethic that you discover uh, that you have through through the schooling will really help you uh, when you get into the engineering field. Yeah. Um, I completely agree with all my fellow, fellow panelists. Um, communication is huge. It's part of your everyday um, work life. Um, I also just wanted to add um, curiosity. Uh, it's really important for you to be curious um, and always to seek out maybe not, not the most obvious solutions um, because that'll help you with the really, really difficult problems um, and also just a love of learning uh, because you're going to need to continuously learn um, throughout your entire careers. So that's important. Great. So if anyone has any other questions, you can raise your hands. And I think there's one over here, Marcy, or a couple over here. But what I'm just reflecting back on what the panel is saying is a lot of what they're saying are, are both technical skills, but a lot of those skills that you, like where do you learn how to, to be a good communicator and talk to people and have good eye contact? eye contact and things like that. So a lot of it takes practice, right? It's finding places that are going to take you out of your comfort zone and pushing yourselves a little bit. And so that's a lot of what I'm hearing from the panel. So in addition to all of the technical aspects, it's, it's the communication, it's all of the things that maybe you don't learn in school, but you're going to help yourselves um, learn as you push your boundaries. All right, next question. Hello, um, Zhang Zhu, from, a 10th grader from Stuyvesant High School. So one question that I have is what sort of what types of courses would you recommend for high schools to take if um, they're interested in engineering, especially in energy? I'm sure I'll take this one. Um, obviously, when you get to college, you're going to be taking a lot of science and math courses, um, and also anything related to computers would help out. So, you know, as you go through high school, uh, focus on your science and your math, because like we said before, English is important, but that'll really be the, the foundation of your education for uh, an engineering curriculum. And then any electives you could take, um, I know things like first robotics competition, stuff like that, where you can get like hands-on and really get to the, uh, the, the, the nitty-gritty like technical side of stuff, where you can actually do some real engineering yourself. That, those types of things help a lot, too. All right, awesome. I hear one of the things that a lot of the conversations we've been having here at NISI is all around computer science. How many of you um, know how to code? Yeah. How many of you guys know how to code? I can't. I have someone on my on my team who's <laughs> right. super smart. Yep. And when I need Same to here. Code, I'm like, can you I, help me? I got someone on my team. She's in the front row right there. Who he knows me, who's really good He gives good me Outlook stuff. buttons, and I'm like, yes. And so it's just really interesting in seeing the direction and you know the embedding of computer science and and being able to code and having that as a technical skill and how that as a technical skill can aid, I think, everything that we're talking about in this discussion, but also as you expand your, your opportunities in STEM. So we had another question over here. I think I saw the microphone being moved around. Yep. Um, hello. Uh, I'm Hamid Dusila from, I'm a junior at University of Prachada High School. Uh, since this is an, an environmental project, I was wondering, like, I just recently learned over there that Condensing gains its power from other companies and stuff. 
So since this is an environmental project, how do Condison in, in, in the future wanna, will make sure that they use more renewable resources instead of oil and coal f in order to better the environment? Okay, so I just want to sum up his question because I think it was a little jumbled for me, so I just want to, you, you shake your head if it's correct, but you're interested in just learning more about how Con Edison is going to be using more renewable resources in the future of their work. Okay? Uh, I can start. I can All start right. with that. Um, so from the STEAM side, uh, so for those of you who do not know, there's a STEAM um, system in Manhattan, and we supply STEAM from 96th Street on the west side all the way down to Battery Park. Um, and Unlike the um, electric side where we don't really own power plants anymore, um, steam has steam generating stations, um, but a couple of our stations can also produce electricity. Um, and what we've done in recent years, and uh, Greg had mentioned it, is uh, we're converting our stations to natural gas. Uh, so when we produce steam and produce electricity, we're using natural gas a majority of the time. And really, oil is only used in emergency situations when gas is not available. Uh, so Con Edison is very focused on environmental impacts. Um, we also use cogeneration. Uh, so we produce electricity and steam at the same time. So we're getting two sources of energy um, with one fuel source. Uh, so we're doing two things at once, and that helps us to reduce our carbon footprint and um, other emissions that we're uh, producing are much less because of that. Um, uh, there's a number of things we worry about. Water usage, we try to you know, reduce our water usage and... Um, we appreciate that. Yes. <laughs> yes. yes, we work closely together very often. Um, but we are very... Um, concerned with environment, especially in New York, there's a lot of environmental regulations that are coming out um, and everybody's really trying to move to cleaner fuels. Uh, so that's really important and we're definitely on the forefront of that. Great. I think there's a question right here that I saw this young man's hand up. So we're gonna pass the mic down to him. Sorry. Just raise your hand one more time. Yeah. There you go. Oh, Hi, I'm Matthew, I'm a sophomore at East Chester High School, and I was just wondering, what do you think is the most outside the box solution you've ever had to use for a challenging problem? A challenging problem. So what's the most out of the box solution you've had to use for a challenging problem? Did I capture that? I can tell you, uh, I recently did, and it sounds really crazy, but it worked was I needed to figure out how much water was leaking out of this structure upstate. And um, the operations team at one point was able to measure it over a weir, doing a simple weir, weir calculation. But at one point, the flow got too great and it, over, it had overcome the weir, so you can no longer do the weir calculation. So they said, well, you know, now we're estimating it. Maybe it's this much, maybe it's this much. We don't know. And I said, well, so I brought my team up there. And I, and I basically, early in my career, I did this at a much smaller scale. But I said, let's go to a wine store and get a, a cork. And basically, I know the dimensions and the length of this conduit that's, that the, the leak goes into. So let's throw the cork in one side. And you get, you, we'll get on our phones. And I'll basically t time how long it takes to get to the end where it's discharged. And pretty much, I, gotta, you know, I just need to get it in the ballpark of what the, the flow was. So it worked. It was creative. That's awesome. What'd you, what'd you do with the rest of that bottle, though, if you just needed a cork? <laughs> I, know. I, I was on work hours. I didn't buy the wine. Great team building. I like that. It's a great, great team support structure. Good solution. Yeah. Um, I, I have one, but I, I can't take credit for this one. I didn't think of the solution, but I, I'm recently working on a construction project that involves this. Um, you, all, you guys all know about Hurricane Sandy. Um, we had a lot of problems with uh, our infrastructure that's on the waterfront getting flooded after Hurricane Sandy or during Hurricane Sandy. So we're doing all sorts of construction work now to either raise equipment up or build moats around equipment. Um, so one of the projects that I'm doing right now is we had to build 10 foot high uh, doors, flood doors in front of every single entrance and exit to a power plant. Now, originally we said, okay, maybe we can use steel for that, but if you could picture a piece of steel, maybe 12 feet wide or 10 feet high, it's a huge piece and it's very hard to maneuver around. So we're actually, uh, the solution we came up with is we're actually using Kevlar, which is the material that bulletproof vests are uh, made out of. 
to stretch across the door and they're attached on either side so that when the flood comes, the Kevlar will hold it back. And I thought that was a really interesting, unique solution um, that was kind of out of the box, so. That's yeah. cool. Well, I'm not an engineer, so I don't have gee whiz solutions like that. But, um, um, but I, going back to Peace Corps days, I was in West Africa, and um, what I will say is that I learned a lot of ingenuity. You don't have a lot of tools at your disposal. You don't have the, the so if you're, you know, I had a moped. I, most of you probably don't know what a moped is, or maybe you've seen one in a, in a 1970s cartoon or something, but uh, I had a little moped and I had to keep that thing going with whatever I had at my disposal and pushing it through uh, you know, overflowing creeks and things like that, getting out the other side, getting the water out of the pistons. <laughs> and so you, know, you learned to, to basically make do with what you had at your disposal. And uh, I think that served me in pretty good stead and some tight fixes after that. So that was my example. That's awesome. <laughs> oh, it's hard. Because I'm mostly in the office, so nothing really, not really MacGyver's too much. Um, that's okay. You I'm trying to think. One thing that we we had to do, um, uh, we had to do some testing of traps. It's basically just a mechanism that's part of a steam distribution system um, to kind of trap condensate, um, and we had to test them, but we really didn't have the. Ex experience of the usual testers that weren't available, uh, the people that usually test them. So they gave us squirt bottles um, and we would spray water on them and then they gave us really long screwdrivers and we would put them on there and if you felt the buzzing of the trap, we knew it was working. So that was really interesting because we were walking around with squirt bottles and screwdrivers. But um, that's the best it's I got. <laughs> the good uses of everyday materials. Exactly. And so, like Mary had said before, it's just thinking of like we talk about design make play here at NYSI, but it's a lot of what you guys are talking about is this creativity, right? And it's finding uses for objects that are, you know, maybe not what they're meant for, but they're going to serve a purpose that's going to help you now. Hi, my name is Daisy. I'm a freshman at Lehman College. And my question is at what point in your life did you realize that this is what you want to dedicate your career to? Or was there like a specific moment or person that you talked to that sold it to you? Like, this is what you want to do? Um, that's a good question, Daisy. I started, uh, I never studied geography in high school or at any point in my uh, grade school. This was before there was, oh, I don't know, common curriculum and some of the reforms in the 1990s where they started reintroducing geography to Americans. I don't know that it's helped that much because there's a lot of Americans who are pretty geographically illiterate still, but, um, <laughs> um, but I, I can very definitely point to my freshman year having a freshman seminar that was in geography but looking really at Central American and Mesoamerican culture. And um, you know the, the heart of geography is human environment interactions, and that really grabbed me. Taking some more courses, and I was considering to be you know potentially a French major, so I would never be on this panel, obviously, <laughs> if I had chosen French instead. But you know that that grabbed me in a really serious way, and I kind of said, "Wow, this combines a little science, not too much to overwhelm me, but also you know some some really interesting uh, history um, and." Um, you know, geopolitics and culture and a range of things. So. Um, I think for me, it was my sophomore year uh, of college during my bachelor's. Um, I went into school, I wasn't really sure. I knew I was good at math and science, but I wasn't sure that engineering was really what I wanted to do. So I went through the first year and I said, man, this is hard, should I stick with this? And my sophomore year, they were doing a trip to, I went to the University of Delaware, it was to the Delaware Memorial Bridge, which is a big suspension bridge uh, that connects New Jersey to Delaware, down at the bottom of the New Jersey Turnpike. And we got this tour of the bridge, um, and it was like maybe a couple hours, two, three hours, and I said, man, this is awesome. I really want to do this. Like, I want to, when I graduate, I want to be out here. I want to be working on infrastructure. Uh, moved back to New York, where I originally was from. And I just thought that was so cool, and it really solidified that this is what I wanted to do. Um, it was a really cool experience, and luckily today I get to, to do stuff like that, um, and I can say that it was a good decision. Yeah, I think um, for me, uh, very similar to Greg, um, I was just really good at math and science in high school, wasn't sure really what I wanted to do. My dad had suggested maybe looking into engineering. I looked into it the more I learned about the types of engineering. I thought, you know, this, this could be a good fit for me. Um, and it was in college that I 
kind of realized that I, I definitely wanted to do this. Um, but it was more, um, it wasn't a class trip, but uh, I had started an internship. I figured I'd start early. So after my freshman year of college, um, that summer I had gotten an internship actually at the engineering firm that I worked with after I graduated. Um, and I got put on a really great team. The people were really nice and really supportive. Um, especially as a girl, sometimes it's a little overwhelming. You're usually one of very few. Um, but it was, a, it was a group of all men, but uh, they were really supportive and really excited to teach me uh, what they knew. Um, and I thought that was so interesting and I, the work that they did was really interesting. Um, and even though I've strayed away from that uh, slightly, um, I think working in that internship and I'm having the hands-on experience um, of what they did every day and almost like having a, a real job because it wasn't an internship where I made copies or you know put binders together. They made me sit there with them and do the calculations and draft you know floor plans and um, it was a lot of the actual technical work that they did and I just helped them and uh, that really helped me decide that that's what I wanted to do. Sometimes I think a career finds you. For me, um, if I was doing what I wanted to do my senior year in high school, I would be a park ranger. <laughs> so um, I thought I wanted to be outside driving one of those really cool Jeep things around in a park. Um, so I knew I wanted to do something with the environment. And when I went in and talked to my um, guidance counselor, she was like, well, you know, Wendy, I see your scores are you know, you're really good at math and science. And I said, but I want to do something with the environment. And she was like, well, here's a brochure for a program in environmental engineering. And I thought, oh my god, this is perfect. It's merging both the things that I really want to do, be close to the environment and work on the environment. Um, and you know, I'm strong in math and science. This makes sense. Um, and I ended up in a college in that program. Um, and then again, um, you know, this goes to show you should do really well in school is my professor picked me out of the class said yeah he's doing really well and wanted me to work in the lab doing some um, water studies um, which was funded which was a good thing for me because I had no money so it's like sweet I'm gonna get a paycheck okay what do I need to do and I started working under him started doing a lot of work with um, some of the local water utilities and you know fast forward almost 20 years and I'm in the water field so it's pretty fun Awesome. That's how it found me. So, oh, we have now we have a lot of questions. So let's try to spread this out. We oh, we have one more here, and then we'll take one in the back, all the way there. Uh, hi, my name is Rory. I'm a junior at Francis Lewis High School, and I was wondering, what was your most challenging project that you've had to overcome recently? Challenging project? Yeah, like challenging obstacle that you've oh, had. Got to it. Um, so I work overseas still. Um, and uh, I, uh, we have some projects in, in West Africa, uh, in the coastal zone. We're looking at how mangroves can build resilience. Uh, that means, you know, basically serve as buffers to uh, coastal storms, that kind of thing. Mangroves are these really cool root, you know, uh, it's a forest ecosystem, but it's in the coastal zone, so they trap soil and sediments and and they also uh, serve as like fish hatcheries. And um, the, the, they, you know, when storms roll in, they can be really helpful because it keeps the, the land from being eroded. But because it's a very complex cultural environment where they're cutting the forests at a rapid clip for uh, fish smoking because they have no refrigeration. So if they had refrigeration, they wouldn't need to cut the, f but you know, they have uh, also demand for housing, for, for construction materials and they're in some areas cutting them for rice culture because they can make more money that way. So these are the kinds of challenges that fascinate me because you're trying to reconcile what people need to do to make a living and actually survive in a very poor country, but also protect a, an ecosystem that um, could be completely cut down if it's not in some way you don't actually square that circle and make that happen. So. That, that to me is a really interesting and challenging question. Uh, I would say one of my biggest challenges recently was um, I did a construction project where we were converting one of our power plants in Manhattan from oil over to natural gas. Um, and if you can imagine, you can't just take a power plant out of service and leave it off for as long as you need to do a construction project. It, you got to take it offline and get it back as quick as you can. 
Um, the amount of work that we needed to do in a really, really short amount of time, which it was about six months, which sounds like a lot of time, but the amount of work that we needed to do in that six months was incredible. Uh, basically overhauling the entire plant from the piping to the burners that create the fire inside the boilers that eventually creates the steam to upgrading all the electrical controls that controls all the valves and go back to the control room so the operators can see the screens and what's going on in the plant. There was a tremendous amount of work that we needed to do uh, and a lot of teamwork that we needed to uh, put together in order to, to get the job done. And it was just a, a huge crunch to get it done, but we, we did it and it was really rewarding once it was over. Awesome, thank you. So did we have another, someone already had the microphone for the next question. <laughs> um, hello, my name is Angel. I'm in ninth grade at Energy Tech High School. So since we were talking about coding and everything, um, my question would be, uh, how does technology play a role in your career? Okay, so one of the things that I love about the program that I work on is I get to do this really cool thing with a torpedo-looking machine that is called an ROV, uh, Remote Operated Vehicle. So um, it's some of the same technology that they use to find the Titanic and that they use um, if, you've covered, if, if you watch any of the news with the, the, air, the flights that go down in the ocean. So I get to send this ROV down into New York City's water supply tunnel. Um, send, you know, we basically shut the tunnel off and send a very small amount of water down just to keep the water moving. And then we launch this ROV and it basically takes 360 degree photos as it goes down the tunnel and we can get eyes in the tunnel without actually draining it and walking through the tunnel. And so um, there's always a big wow factor and it's pretty cool um, getting, you know, being there and it's really almost a 24-7 um, operation. We shut the tunnel down and um, being there watching the screens and TV, it's like I feel like I'm NASA. Um, it's pretty amazing. Um, it's all kinds of you know, ultrasonic um, equipment and altimeters. And I mean, these things are just wet, really well equipped and sensitive cameras. So really, technology um, plays a part in lots of different things that we do. It's fun. Um, so uh, a lot of the work that I do is on a computer, um, use a lot of different computer programs uh, to do analyses. Uh, but one interesting thing that we're actually doing now is uh, we have a number of, we have you know five generating stations that we own and one that we are supplied by that's uh, privately owned. And um, you know there's a ton of different boilers and other pieces of equipment at each of these stations and we have a control center um, that dispatches these units um, to meet our customers' loads. And we're, uh, right now they have a, a, um, an Excel sheet that they use. Uh, it's an Excel calculation, it's a little complicated. Um, and it kind of guides them on to which units to dispatch before others um, to be economical, um, environmentally uh, sound, and also for liability purposes. Um, and we're currently working on a computer program um, that's going to do that more automatically um, with less manual inputs um, to assist our dispatchers in picking the right units um, for our customers' needs. So that's pretty exciting. Um, so geography has its technology too. It's called geographic information systems. So think of um, you know a pretty map, but then think of all the data that goes into that map. So actually, I'm sure many of these people use GIS as well um, because you can't dig anywhere in New York City without knowing exactly where your pipes are. There's probably, you know, I'm sure you have 3D imaging of, you know, what actually is underground. Uh, but, you know, GIS technology is, um, you know, really proliferated across a whole range of fields and we teach GIS at Columbia University to students in public health, architecture, engineering, a whole range of different fields. Um, and one of the cool things that's coming along is, is the, the ability to do more and more analytics over the web. So you have, it used to be you had to buy a standalone GIS package like ArcGIS or QGIS or a range of, there's, you know, a bunch of GIS packages, but uh, now you can do this using open geospatial consortium specs, specs and essentially do what they call web processing. And, and so I'm not a coder, but I'm really excited by what the coders are able to do, and we produce some really pr 
pretty neat applications, including a recent iPhone application, which basically allows you to tell, you know, draw a circle using your iPhone uh, on the map, and it tells, returns the population in that area. So we've got in there a nuclear power plants database, we've got in there a bunch of um, uh, reservoirs and dams, and we've got in there a number of hazards. And so the idea is that if a, an earthquake or something occurs, you can draw a circle around that and instantly return how many people may be affected by that. So I'd say uh, I use a ton of different uh, computer programs on a daily basis, but one example that I like to use that's relatively simple is uh, when I have a problem out in the field on a construction site, maybe something isn't able to be installed like the engineer had designed it. Um, previously, what the process would be is I'd take pictures on like a digital camera or something like that, go back to my computer, upload them, and write what's called an RFI, request for information, send it to the engineer, wait for a response. Long story short, it, it was a very long process. Um, Nowadays, with iPhones, what I've actually done sometimes recently is I will FaceTime the engineer and I'll show him what the problem is, say, hey, this is supposed to go here, obviously we can't fit it or something along those lines, and I'll get a solution in real time, which helps the project move along a lot more smoothly. Um, it's just a, a small example of how technology is helping to expedite things, and there's tons of examples that, uh, across the board. Awesome. So, Marcia, we have time for one more question, so I don't know where the microphone has landed. <laughs> um, but you can you can choose that last. I think we have it's it's landed somewhere. Okay. <laughs> Hi, I'm Amanda. I'm a sophomore at Hunter College, and something I've noticed as a trend over the last couple of years is you turn on the TV, you go on the internet, and you see almost um, an exploitation of our environmental problems. So you see people being like, the polar bears, the ice caps, you know, uh, New York is gonna be underwater by 2020. All of these things that are a, a little bit outrageous, but at the same time, very real um, problems. And among all of this, you know, terrible things that you hear, please, can we just have some good news? Do you guys have anything to, can, can we just have some good news? <laughs> 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 Wendy, <laughs> Wendy mentioned <laughs> her, her dam uh, um, and the aqueducts that you're repairing, but at the same time, millions and millions of gallons of water, and you did give it a context, but even for someone like me, that's an inconceivable amount of water. And even though you said that you are going to fix it, um, I guess my dual-ended question is, one, What's, can we please have some good news? <laughs> and the second thing is, what can we as individuals, human beings sitting here right now do, do to help or, or help out our environment? I guess, yeah, that's what I want to say. Well, thank you. If my uh, colleague in um, the Bureau of Environmental Planning and Analysis were here as part of DEP, she would be telling you, how long do you shower? And it should, let me give you this little uh, shower meter that five minutes or less, and you know all the things that you should be doing to save water, because she manages the demand management for New York City. So um, one, one thing that's really positive is that in the exception of New York City's water supply, we had at one point thought that New York City was going to grow at such an exponential rate, and that water use would be, by now, at two billion gallons of water a day. And we are actually at a historic low. Um, and our, every year we, our water use goes down. So we're at one, million, uh, one billion gallons of water a day, uh, 1,000 million gallons of water a day. So that's positive, right? So um, our, our washing machines and our shower heads and our faucets are getting more efficient and we're saving more and more water. And I think that consumers are um, definitely, the awareness is there. Um, so they are showering less and using less water in general. So, I think that's a really positive message. And that's really great for us in terms of the water supply um, and for our customers whose bills are um, based on, you know, how much water and how much chemical we're delivering to, you know, how much all of our operations cost. So, yay, that's really positive. <laughs> Even though we're losing that 35 million gallons of water a day, which will be fixed very soon. So on the flip side of the DEP coin to the Con Ed side, the electric side, instead of taking shorter showers, you can use less electricity, right? So, so one person using a little bit less electricity, is it gonna have an impact? No, but if everybody does it, right, it's gonna have a significant impact. And I think that's a message that you have to, do you need that light on? No, do you need the TV on? Do you need all these things on at once? No, try to reduce your usage just a little bit because if everybody does it, then we're gonna see a drop in that electricity usage, 
which ultimately goes back to the amount of carbon and things like that, your carbon footprint, how much emissions we have. Um, so I think that's one small thing that you could do to, to help out. And, and a positive, um, maybe I'll let you, you touch on this a little bit more, but we're seeing um, a significant increase in the amount of natural gas that we're using compared to oil that was used for many years and coal, which is even dirtier. Coal and oil are very dirty fuels. We're seeing this great shift over to natural gas and Con Ed's natural gas side of uh, the business is really growing nowadays. Um, I think that's a really positive, really uh, good thing for the future because it's just a cleaner fuel overall. Yeah, I think on, on our side, we've definitely been working towards that and lowering our emissions. Um, and again, you know, there's little things that you could do, just wasting less energy at home. Um, oh, now I'm having a brain fart. I had one thing that I was going to say. Um, but yeah, it's really, if you want to help, it's really the little things that you could do, you know, maybe public transportation, taking public transportation, all those little things. Um, just mean that we're using less fuel to produce the energy that you need. So. so I sent an email to my colleagues just yesterday actually saying, I noticed there's a lot of flat panel monitors that are on at night and some of them do go off by themselves, but some of them just remain on, you know, and so I sent a little link to how much energy was being consumed and we're meant to be an environmental group and so, uh, you know, it seems to me that there should be already that consciousness, but there isn't always, you know, it's, it's true. Um, so I'm a Christian, and I could say I give you the good news, but I won't, you know, I'll spare you that. Because um, uh, I, I don't think that's what you meant. But um, uh, what I do think, though, however, is uh, the, the case is that, that what we're seeing with a lot of these really, and I understand there's a lot of anxiety today about the issues that are going on, not just with the environment, but you know, geopolitics and, and you know, various types of extremism, um, is that it is bringing, I think, people together in some new ways. And uh, you know, uh, Wendy was talking about water, actually the history of of, of around water has been more one of cooperation than conflict if you look at it from a geopolitical perspective that actually it brings shared river basins tend to bring countries together not split them although we don't know what will happen in the future but we have to resist that tem tendency to say I'm going to throw up walls I'm going to take care of myself and you know gated communities come to mind and things like that and actually, you know, build community and try to work together towards solutions, and, and that's certainly what motivates me. So I hope that's somewhat positive. Can I say one more thing? Sure. So something that's really, I don't know if it's a buzzword, but um, what we've been using a lot is changing our culture. And we've been focused on safety because we deliver construct capital construction projects. So, um, but since we are also a DEP, um, one of the things that we've tried to do is we institute um, health and safety moments on, in any meeting that we have. So we always start a meeting with a health and safety moment and that can be actually an environmental moment as well. So, um, we're, you know, we do this and people at first, um, like almost three years ago we started this, they thought it was kind of funny. Uh, and they were kind of joking about it and the things that we were, you know, and it was things at home or things at work, it could have been anything. Um, and three years later, we really find that, you know, people are very mindful of different things and, and topics on the environment and safety on our sites and in the office. And it really is changing the culture. Um, so, you know, when you talk about it, people think about it. Um, I talk about it at home and my five-year-old literally told my, hu my husband the other day, Daddy, turn the, turn the water off, you're wasting energy. Or you, you know, she doesn't understand, but she, you know, just from hearing us. So, you know, it starts with changing culture. So when you talk about it, you're changing a culture. All right, awesome. I think that we had a great conversation tonight, and I don't think we're going to bring it to a close. Instead, we're going to invite a lot of other people to join the conversation. And so I'm getting some eyes down here. Um, but up on the screen, if you notice, on, on the name tags of the folks in the room, we've tried to help you guys just identify who might be folks that you want to talk to based on your interest. So engineering, we have a lot of engineering folks, both from Con, Ed, from Con Edison here. So if I could have all of our folks with a blue name tag or a blue little um, stripe on their name tag stand up, that would be awesome so we can see who we can talk to later on in the evening. Mm -hmm. Thank you for being here and volunteering your time. 
And so you can find them um, at the next part when we walk downstairs and have lots of opportunity for one-on-one -on -one conversations or small group conversations. Thank you, guys. Now I'm going to ask for our folks with green, our environmental group. Oh, they're, they're still here. Yep, so we have them. They're all spread out. I think that there might be more than just what we've, list, we've listed here. And then we had folks from our, the gold program at Con Edison, which you know would be great to talk to. They're over there. They had that awesome table. Lots of excitement happened over there. Uh, awesome, thank you. Uh, and then we had folks from Information Resources right in the middle. They're ready, ready for you guys also. And then lastly, Construction. All right, so these are, so as you guys can see, you have more than just, uh, more opportunity to talk with folks out, outside of our panel. I wanna thank our panel for a really great conversation and discussion and all of your great points. And I'd also like to thank you guys for coming out and our, our additional networks that are, networkers that are here to help you know, share your wisdom, your knowledge, your experiences um, with, with our participants. Um, we really appreciate it. It's those connections to folks that are in the careers that help really enlighten what you're doing and what the possibilities are. So before anyone gets up to go anywhere, I'm gonna ask anyone, all of our networkers, um, to follow Andrea, that's Andrea over there, and she's gonna take you guys downstairs, you can like breathe before you are bombarded by this group of young people. Um, so we'll get you guys set up. You guys, yeah, you can, I'd love to get a picture with all of you before you go, so if you could hold on for one second. And then as they are walking downstairs, one thing I wanna mention to you guys is, in addition to the agenda and the bios that you got tonight, you got an evaluation form to just give us some feedback on your experiences tonight. This is to really help us to shape future events, the parts that you found really helpful, the parts that you liked, the conversations you enjoyed, but also the things that, you know, maybe you wish the timing was longer or shorter, or you wish, you know, instead of empanadas, we had cheeseburgers. Like, I don't know what you guys might want. I can't do cheeseburgers. I'm just gonna put that out there right now. Um, but any, any kind of feedback that you can give, you really help drive the type of programming that we shape just, shape just from your input. So before you leave, you can find myself. You saw who Andrea was. You can see Marcia's over there in the corner. Um, we would love to get an evaluation back from all of you. And we will stock the doors, right? So in case you try to leave without it, you know, no, we won't stock the doors, but we just really would love for you to, to take that time. So thank you all for coming. You can start making your way just around. You'll have a bunch of people to talk to as you walk downstairs, and I will have our lovely panel join you there in a moment. Thank you guys, have a good night.